and welcome to the 40th in our series on Middle Eastern Islamic history, uh, specifically on the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 and uh, the larger uh, Abdul Hamid II period. So for those who are unfamiliar, uh, here are the rules. The first is that uh, this is not an academic presentation. I am not accredited in history, philosophy, religion, or any of the topics that we're going to be discussing. I am just a layperson that's trying to uh, show what I know and what I care about about this topic, and hopefully that you care about it as well. Uh, this is going to be a secular presentation, despite the fact that there will definitely be religious topics that we discuss. This is going to try and approach it from a historical point of view. Now, given the sensitivity of these topics, we're going to start to move into the period of massive discrimination against the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire. Um, please, uh, let's be respectful of the topic. That said, I do love interactivity. Questions, comments, clarifications are always welcome in the chat. I do read the chat and I will respond in kind. What I usually like to say is that these presentations are a class that's a, both a 101 and a 201, meaning that if you don't know anything, I'll catch you up on the basics. And if you already know something, I'll probably tell you something that you still didn't know. I also like to implement a two hour hard stop, which means that by nine o'clock, um, wherever we are, that's the slide that we're gonna stop on. I will continue a discussion, but I won't reveal any new material. And that's an agreement between me and you uh, as presenter and audience. Another point is that when I put a date, that's not the birth and death of the person, that's the dates that they served in whatever role they had, be it as prime minister or uh, general or president or caliph or uh, any other role that they may have had. And this presentation, like the other 39 in the series that came before it, as long with our numerous other series uh, are recorded. And this will also be a recording. You can watch them later. You can watch them together. In fact, this is a sort of a continuation of episodes 31 and the first half of episode 32. So in many ways, it may even make more sense to watch them out of order if you're just going to follow the trajectory of the Ottoman Empire alone. So everybody has been missing our favorite part, the quiz, for the last few weeks as we've been trying to catch up on the Assyrians and Kurds. And let's see how much we remember from that time. So question number one, which of the following best characterizes the situation of the Assyrians after the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire? A, the Assyrians were subject to a large scale genocide effectively ending the Assyrian people. B, the Assyrians were deported to central Anatolia and most became Hittites. C, the Assyrians remained a large component of the people in the Jazeera region, as evidenced by temples to Assyrian gods, written Akkadian and Aramaic records, and positions of power. Or D, trick question, the Neo-Assyrian Empire never fell. No, we have, um, I have one guess of B and one guess of C, and C is the correct answer. The Assyrians remained um, a population throughout the Jazeera region. In fact, uh, they were probably close to either a significant minority or the majority of the people in the Jazeera region. They uh, were not deported uh, in large numbers to Anatolia. There were deportations um, throughout the, what is today Iran and Iraq, but not in the direction of Turkey. Um, the idea that they were subject to genocide has been largely ruled out by most modern Assyriologists. And the Assyrian Empire certainly did fall. It fell in 609 when, uh, when King Asha Ubali II uh, was defeated in the Battle of Haran. Question number two, which of the following best describes the development of the term Kurd? A, Kurds were documented as an ethnic group by the Medes during the days of Deokes. Uh, Kurd originally referred to a Persian nomad and only really had a consistent ethnic application in the 9th century, bolstered by the development of Kurdish states in the 10th century. Mesopotamian, Aramaic, and Arabic speakers used the word Kurd as a general term to describe Persian people west of the Zagros Mountains, and it stuck after the reign of Saladin. And D, uh, Kurd was the endonym for the Sirani-speaking tribesmen and became an exonym for the Kurdish people in general during the days of Xenophon. We have one guess of A. Uh, A is actually incorrect. Um, during the days of Deokes, um, we have the use of the term Kurt, which refers to a nomadic group, but uh, we don't really see it applied with any fidelity to any ethnic group. The correct answer is B. Um, 
that uh, they're talking about per, uh, that they were originally termed for po Persian nomads. And then eventually we see the word Kurd uh, becoming uh, a reference to the Persianites who live in the Zagros Mountains and in the mountainous regions in the Jazeera. Um, Mesopotamian, Aramaic, and Arabic speakers did not use the word Kurd, it's a Persian word. Um, and uh, Kurd was never used by the Sorani speaking tribesmen for themselves until after it was used um, by others for them. Okay, question number three. Which three of the following statements are accurate descriptions of the Kurdish religious diversity? A, Kurdish religions were uh, consistently very distinct from the religions of the Persians, Arabs, and Turks, with majorities of Kurds staying outside of the traditional Sunni and Shiite religious traditions. B, despite Kurds having many different religions, the majority of Kurds have consistently been Sunni Muslims. C, religions like Yazidism and Yarsanism have an almost exclusively Kurdish or Kurdish speaking members and focus on ideas like reincarnation, Baltinia, and divine avatars. D, Kurdish Christianity was one of the driving forces in the creation of the Church of the East. E, Kurds were not consistently tolerant of their fellow Kurds' religions, like Badr Khan Beg, who persecuted the Yezidis despite being a Sunni Kurd himself. And F, Kurds were effectively evangelists for their religions, sorry, were effective evangelists for their religions, spreading them into Central Asia. And I have one answer, B. B is definitely one of the three right answers. Uh, let's see if there are any others. We have another answer of C. Yeah, B and C are both correct answers. So we're, we're only missing one other one. The last correct answer is E. Um, there were Kurds who, like Badr Khan Beg, who attacked other uh, Kurds who may have had a different religion. Now, whether Yazidis are an ethno-religion or not is certainly a debated topic, but they're certainly Kurdish speaking. And so they fit into the Kurdish world. Uh, despite that, many Sunni Kurds like Badr Khan Beg uh, persecuted them for their religious heterodoxy. So um, A is not true, um, right? Uh, the majority of Kurds are Sunni. So, the, um, so A is wrong because B is correct. Um, D is incorrect because the driving force, the creation of the Church of the East were the Assyrians, not the Kurds. Um, and F is false because most Kurdish religions, like Yazidism, like Yarsanism, like Shabakism, um, are almost exclusively um, religions that are held by Kurds. Um, and, in, and in fact, the Shiite beliefs, like those of the Faili Kurds, um, are very distinct and are only manifested in the Kurds themselves. Okay, question number four. Which of the following are accurate statements about Dawud Men Balashvili, or Dawud Pasha of Iraq? Choose all that apply. A, he was a Georgian Mamluk ruling over Iraq. B, his goal was to modernize Iraq in the same vein that Egypt had been modernized. C, he was able to defeat the Ottoman Ali Reza Pasha, preserving Iraq's autonomy. D, he maintained good relations with the larger Ottoman Empire, sending both men and gold to support the Ottomans in the Russo-Turkish War of 1828 to 1829. E, he founded Iraq's first major newspaper, the Journal al Iraq. F, he worked with French military advisors to create a modern Iraqi military. So multiple answers are correct here. A is correct. He was a Georgian Mamluk. B is correct. He was trying to modernize Iraq uh, similarly to Egypt. Um, F. F is also correct. Yes, he worked with the French military advisors to create a modern Iraqi military. C is incorrect. Ali Reza Pasha defeated him and conquered Baghdad in the name of unifying the Ottoman Empire. Um, D is incorrect. He refused to send men and gold uh, to support the Ottomans in the Russo-Turkish War of 1828. Um, and E is correct. Uh, he founded Iraq's first major newspaper, the Journal of Iraq. So the answers are A, B, E, and F. Dawud Pasha was the last Georgian Mamluk to rule over Iraq. Question number five. Which of the following best describes the Battle of Ain Dara in 1711? A, the Qaisi Druze, supporting the Sunni Shahab clan, opposed the Yemeni Druze, with both sides having a religiously diverse set of allies, Maronites, Druze, Sunnis, and Shiites. 
B. The Qaisi Druze and the Yemeni Druze formed an alliance against other religious populations of Mount Lebanon in order to preserve their wealth status as Multazems. C. The Maronite population of Lebanon rose up against the Qaisi Druze Multazems, resulting in a Druze led massacre of Maronites, many fleeing to Damascus. D. The French, led by Beaufort d'Opoul, uh, defeated Ottoman forces, compelling the creation of the Mount Lebanon Mutasarifat. Answer A is a guess, and that is correct. Um, one of the important things to notice about the uh, Mount Lebanon uh, situation, uh, sorry, the Battle of Ain Dara, is that it was pitting Druze against Druze, and they had a number of different allies on either side. Uh, B is incorrect. The Qaisi and the Yemeni were the opposite sides of the, of the Druze conflict. C is a description of the Lebanese Civil War of 1860. And... Uh, D is the end of the Lebanese Civil War of 1860. So those are two different, uh, those refer to a different battle situation. All right, so now moving into sort of a discussion, we had mentioned last time, um, so we're, we're beginning now a situation where we're going to examine three parallel tracks again. And we've done this before, right? Where we had three parallel tracks moving through the same uh, period. And now we're moving through the period of the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire prior to World War I and the dissolution of the Qajar Empire just prior to World War I as well. Um, and so we're going to see the Balkan Wars next week and the Pahlavi Shahs in Iran in two weeks um, taking over from the Qajars and the whole constitutional period that preceded it. And today we're gonna to talk about Abdul Hamid and the Young Turk Revolution. But all these three things are occurring in tandem. And so we're gonna see a lot of bleed through uh, from each to the others. The thing is though, that it's important for us to segregate them and separate them as their own individual pieces so that we can understand them a little bit better. And then we can later appreciate in the wider context how all these three fit together. So we discussed back in episode 31, for those who remember, um, the development of the Tanzimat reforms, which was the modernization of the Ottoman Empire. And it was really led by Mustafa Rashid Pasha, who was an Anglophile, and his two students, Mehmet Fuad Pasha and Mehmet Amin Ali Pasha, who were more Francophile. Uh, but regardless, they believed in a liberal orientation for the Ottoman Empire, right? And liberals believe in governments that are based on written constitutions. They support constitutional republics. They want governments to protect individual freedoms, whereas conservatives were more in favor of uh, historic absolutist monarchy, established religion, and that protests caused more problems than they solved. And it wasn't that there were no conservative forces in the Ottoman Empire at a ground level either, right? We talked about, for example, Hussein Gradoscevich, um, who ruled the Bosnia Ayelet uh, in 1831. He revolted because of the, ten, of the direction that the Ottoman Empire was going towards Tanzimat, towards further union and integration in a more liberal scheme. We also talked about how during much of the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire really looked to fortify its relationship with the United Kingdom and saw the United Kingdom as really its bulwark. And part of that was that they engaged in a number of trade treaties uh, with the British, the most famous of these being the Treaty of Balta Liman in 1838, which opened up the Ottoman Empire to British imports um, and allowed uh, uh, British companies to compete on a more equal footing with Ottoman companies, which effectively would be drive those Ottoman companies out of existence because the British could produce goods for far more cheaply. We also have another development of Tanzimat, which is going to be expanded in this later period that we're going to talk about, which was Ottomanism. The idea that all the people of the Ottoman Empire should share one common national identity that wasn't divided along ethnic lines as it had been through much of the Ottoman Empire's history. In many ways, Ottomanism uh, is inspired to a certain extent by the concept of Americanism, right? This idea that many people come from different origins, different religions, different ethnicities, but yet they share some sort of value in the territory and in the ideals of uh, the state in which they live. And that's really where Ottomanism comes from. And this was a very controversial idea when it was first proposed because 
while it was understandable that modernization would have to occur, technological development and advancement, it wasn't entirely clear that a new social identity and structure would have to go along with it. But most people who wanted to hold the Ottoman Empire together felt that without the strong creation of a national identity, it was going to fracture along these ethnic lines. Now, one of the main successes of the Tanzimat reforms was that it brought the British and the French into the Ottoman side in the, battle, in the Crimean War, which ended up being a victory uh, by the British and the French against the Russians, with the Ottomans having played a tertiary role in that fight. In fact, um, in the Battle of Sinop at the very beginning of the war, um, almost the entire Ottoman fleet was sunk by the Russians. But because the Ottoman Empire won, the values of the Tanzimat were vindicated. They had resulted in the British and French allying themselves with the Ottoman Empire. And from an Ottoman perspective, especially among more conservative individuals, that was what granted legitimacy, not the protection of those individual rights and freedoms that Tanzimat ostensibly gave, but that it meant that Western countries would be willing to support the Ottoman Empire as it became less and less capable of fighting Russia. That said, despite the victory in the um, Crimean War, the Ottoman government was heavily in debt. And, in, and even with um, the Imperial Ottoman Bank, the Banke Osmane e Shahane, um, even with this bank, uh, the Ottoman Empire was naturally uh, going to end up in debt for fielding these large armies and not having the modern manufacturing economy that could sustain uh, that kind of size. And so we have a new generation towards the end of the 1800s called the Young Ottomans. And we should be careful because we're gonna talk about Young Ottomans and Young Turks today. Those are two different groups. And the Young Ottomans um, had a number of criticisms of the Tanzimat reforms, but not of the overall idea that reforms needed to be made. Namik Kemal and Ibrahim Shinasi, for example, um, led this movement, and it's a movement of very disparate individuals, but they had some common tying beliefs, the most important of which was they believed that representative democracy was critical in creating uh, and facilitating the increase in Tanzimat rights and protections for the individual. Mustafa Rashid Pasha and his disciples had always believed in an enlightened despotism uh, as the primary model. And so this shift to uh, wanting the people involved would require a parliament, it would require printing presses, it would require publication of the ideas. You also had this idea that Islam had some role to play in uh, organizing this new Ottoman government as well. Islamic values should provide some sort of moral compass. Now, Namik Kemal and Ibrahim Shinasi in particular were not terribly sold on uh, any religious establishment, but they did feel that there should be a moral core to the state. Um, and so like Islamic principles say, uh, evil should be forbidden and good should be enjoined. And this led to, uh, on the uh, Islamic side, the creation of the Majella, uh, which was led by Ahmed Jabdad Pasha. Um, and it was a codification of the Sharia judgments into a legal codex in the French style. Um, which was incredibly powerful. Um, and the Majella is still used in large extent in many places in the Islamic world uh, that were formerly part of the Ottoman Empire when it comes to family law and other similar edicts. Now, in 1876, there were three Pashas in three years, as we talked about. Murad V was clinically insane, which, is, which was why he was removed from power. But um, this shift in power between Abdulaziz dying of old age, Murad V being removed for, uh, for his uh, medical conditions, and Abdul Hamid II coming into power. It gave the Prime Minister Ahmed Shafiq Midhal Pasha, um, who was a liberal um, in orientation, the ability to implement the first Ottoman parliament, the Ottoman parliament of 1876. Now, the election for this parliament was subject to numerous intrigues and problems. Probably the biggest one um, was that um, votes were swayed by nobles. People were paid for their votes. There were, there were uh, in addition to bribes, there, were, there was also violence perpetrated against those who didn't want to vote a certain way. 
when they were in the parliament itself, there was really no decorum. People would shout over each other. There was really no understanding of how it was supposed to happen. Combine that with the fact that the bankruptcy um, that I was just talking about had happened only two or three years earlier. It meant that the Ottoman government was really dealing with how to deal, how to uh, discuss the bankruptcy and not the greater issues um, that would uh, deal with the long term viability of the empire on sort of a uh, and sort of a philosophical or political realm. And also it led to the representation of Christians and Jews in the Ottoman parliament to a degree that many Muslim supremacists or supremacists at that time um, were very unhappy with. Many Muslims believed it was not the place in a Muslim majority country for Jews and Christians to have their own legal representatives in a parliament that would be on par with Muslims. And Abdul Hamid II did not like being restrained in what he could or could not do, which this parliament absolutely had the power to do. Now to compound this, just as the parliament is being set up, there are problems going on in the Balkan region. In Herzegovina, you have Serbs who are revolting. Um, you have attacks by um, the leaders of Ma uh, Montenegro and of independent Serbia. And you have uh, the Batak massacre, which is an Ottoman repression um, of a Bulgarian uprising. And the way that these uh, uprisings were dealt with um, led the Russians to declare war on the Ottoman Empire. Now, unlike Mustafa Rashid Pasha, who had cultivated really great relations uh, with the British and Fuad Pasha, who had cultivated uh, great relations with the French, by the time uh, 1878 rolls around, um, those relations are not going very well. And so the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 to 1878 that we talked about was a massive Russian victory. Now, let's not, let's not ignore how well the Ottomans actually did in the war. The Ottoman army was better than the Ottoman army had ever been. It was very modernized, very developed. They were, uh, they were training in military schools. It just happened that the Russians were so much better um, that they really outclassed uh, the Ottomans. And they did so on both the Eastern and Western fronts. In particular, um, on the Eastern front in the Caucasus, four of the major Russian generals were of Armenian heritage. And this began um, conspiracies within the Ottoman Empire that Armenians were actively assisting the Russians. And these will increase and expand as we discuss in today's uh, conversation. Of course, these were Russian citizens of Armenian extraction. These were not Ottoman Armenians who had somehow defected to Russia. One of the things that we need to take into account, and we discussed it during episode 32, is that there were numerous massacres in the Balkans perpetrated by both Muslims and by Christians against those of the other sect. So you can see, and also in the Caucasus region. So for example, in Tarnava, we had Greeks attacking uh, Turks and Jews who were living in the, in the town and they were forced to flee um, into Anatolia. In fact, the, flee, the fleeing from Tarnava and from a number of other places in the Balkans created the first wave of Muhajir or uh, migrants who came into Anatolia, um, both Muslims and Jews, but predominantly Muslims. Um, and this created uh, a natural wave of resentment towards the Christians. There's a question, uh, were there any Western generals who fought the Ottomans in the 1877 to 1878 war? Uh, what exactly made the Russians qualitatively better? So the first it's much easier to answer. There were no Western generals who fought on the Ottoman side. Uh, it was entirely an Ottoman run operation. Um, and for example, you have here, this is Osman Nuri Pasha. Osman Nuri Pasha was a well-respected um, uh, high level general in the Ottoman army. And he was the one who commanded the battle of Shipka Pass. Um, he was also responsible for the battle of Plevna, which was uh, a Bulgarian uh, with Russian support, uh, siege of an Ottoman castle in what is today Bulgaria. The Ottomans fought incredibly honorably and they fought incredibly well by modern standards. Um, but the question is why were the Russians decisively better? The Russians had better training, they had larger numbers and um, they had a better understanding of tactical movements. Um, that's, that's, those are really the reasons. 
Now, back to this. So you had, for example, Bulgarians and Greeks attacking uh, Jews and Turks, but you also had uh, massacres of Bulgarians, like the uh, massacre at Stara Sagora, which was uh, a number of Bulgarians were massacred there and they were formed into a skull mountain in order to um, scare the Bulgarians into not resisting further. And the massacres like Stara Sagora, where Christians were targeted, or the ones in the east where Kurds and Circassians attacked Armenians uh, in the mountains, um, these were highly publicized in Britain and in France, which further endangered the Ottoman British relationship. We also discussed how in the Treaty of San Stefano, the Ottoman Empire was completely cut apart, um, but some of that was undone in the Congress of Berlin, which settled the borders of the Balkans until the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, more or less. Um, and this created a new and interesting phenomenon from the perspective of the Ottomans. Otto von Bismarck, who was the new chancellor of Germany, was the one who had decided to convene this conference and was the one who backtracked all of uh, Bulgaria's holdings. You can see in this picture uh, sort of a brown line that goes from Bulgaria's borders uh, through what's today North Macedonia into Greece uh, and into some of Turkey. Um, that was the territory of Bulgaria granted by the Russian uh, imposed treaty of San Stefano. Um, but Otto von Bismarck pulled it back to an independent Bulgaria and a semi-autonomous um, East Rumelia region just below it. Um, because Germans didn't really have a dog in the fight, um, their actions in restraining uh, the growth of the, Bal uh, of the Balkan states and keeping the Ottoman Empire intact facilitated increasingly warm relations between the Ottoman Empire and Germany which we're going to see develop in this discussion. So after the war of, eight, uh, of 1877 to 1878, with the Ottoman Empire suitably defeated, Sultan Abdul Hamid II capitalized on the public discontent to engage in what was called istibdad, the, um, the uh, centralization and consolidation of power. So remember that the justification in many cases for Tanzimat was that the proliferation of greater rights would put the Ottomans within the liberal circle of European politics, and therefore the Europeans would be willing, uh, Britain and France, the liberal Europeans would be willing to support the Ottoman Empire against Russia, its arch rival. And that clearly hadn't happened in 1877 and 1878. Um, Ottoman-British relations were tarnished quite severely. Prime Minister Gladstone of the United Kingdom um, made very clear that he saw the, uh, the cause of the Christians in the Balkans uh, being repressed by the Ottomans and subject to Muslim persecution as something with which Britain could find no agreement and no comport. Um, and increasingly, as the British controlled Egypt, right? Remember the Egyptian, the, the British uh, were consolidating their hold in Egypt. They would take it directly in 1882. Um, they were no longer as worried about uh, the Ottoman empire um, being uh, a linchpin to protect themselves from India. In fact, um, they were much more willing to discuss that issue with the Russians in Persia. So the British are moving further away from Abdul Hamid II, and they even try to instigate reform movement in the Ottoman Empire in order to uh, destroy this, uh, the reign of Abdul Hamid II. And it's what's called the Chiragan incident, and this is the Chiragan Palace. At this time in the Ottoman Empire, each, pa each uh, sultan built himself a palace. And so this, the Chiragan was the palace of, Mur uh, of Murad V, right? That was that um, a mentally unstable, mentally unwell um, sultan that was removed in 1876. And so he was living sort of under house arrest in his own palace. The British conspired with Ali Suavi, who was an Ottoman parliamentarian, ethnic Turk. Um, who, uh, in order to bring uh, Murad V into the Sultanate, with Ali Suavi being his uh, prime minister, in order to replace Abdul Hamid II. The plot was discovered, um, Ali Suavi was executed, 
and Murad V was returned to the Chiragan um, and put under house arrest for the rest of his life. That further convinced Abdul Hamid II to uh, absolve the, uh, dissolve the parliament. And given the disastrous results in the war of 1878, um, he was able to get public support for this as well. And so starting in 1880, he governs from his new palace, the Yildiz Palace, um, where he will remain in power until about 1908. Now, while Abdul Hamid was in power, he was not content to just allow the continuation of the developments that had happened before him. He was certainly a reformer to a certain degree, but he realized that reform without guidance would lead back to the parliament, which he utterly despised. So what he decided to do was to streamline the thought within the Ottoman Empire. And he did this through several different mechanisms. The first one he did is that he created an easy brain drain mechanism, meaning that he provided a way for individuals who were not interested in staying within the Ottoman Empire to leave the Ottoman Empire. Um, and the way he did this is that he provided an easy escape route to Geneva or to Paris. And so you have uh, Turkish exile societies being formed in Geneva and in Paris, publishing um, about reforms that they would consider within the Turkish empire. But of course, their books were banned within the empire itself. And this way, any um, troublemakers, let's say, would not be in the country to bother the regime. And in fact, there were numerous such troublemakers from all ends of the political spectrum, those who were even more conservative than Abdul Hamid II, some who were young Ottomans, some who were young Turks, some who were unaffiliated. And we're going to see some of those people when they return uh, to the Ottoman Empire and how they put forth their vision. Another thing that he did was he built numerous schools and it, he didn't just build universities, although his universities are more famous. You can see the Darul Funun Ishahane on the left-hand side. That's the building that looks almost like a US um, governmental building. Um, and Durul Funun literally means the house of the arts and Shahane is national. So it, the national um, house of the arts, but we also have the building of numerous elementary schools, middle schools and high schools in order to create a coherent sense of national identity. Um, Abdel Hamid II was very much an Ottomanist um, and believed that there should be a strong sense of Ottoman identity along with the technological and developmental growth that was occurring within the Ottoman Empire. And so his goal was to inculcate that sense of Ottomanism from the earliest age as possible. But it wasn't only schools through which he managed to streamline thought within the Ottoman Empire. He also developed institutions and agencies in order to police the thought of the country. And so for the first time within the Ottoman Empire, we have the Yildiz Istihbarat Teshkilati, or the Yildiz Intelligence Agency, and the Amuru Hafiye, or the Secret Police. And these two agencies were responsible for spying on Ottoman citizens and uh, subjecting them to violence or punishment uh, if those individuals were believed to be supporting ideas contrary to those of Abdul Hamid II. This created a wave of ideological purity and also led to um, a more unified sense of Turkish identity uh, during this later Ottoman period. We also, as I mentioned earlier, we see an inclination towards Germany and the formation of an Ottoman-German alliance that really occurs during this period. The first thing is that the Germans helped negotiate the Ottoman public debt. And so you can see this is, this is the Ottoman public debt administration building. Um, it was coordinated as such in 1881. It is currently a high school now in Istanbul, but uh, the building is uh, still the way that it was uh, about over 100 years ago. And the public debt administration was designed to allow the Ottoman government to continue to invest in developing its infrastructure, while at the same time paying back its European and internal Ottoman creditors, because a number of private individuals within the Ottoman Empire had also lent the government money. Maintaining this debt administration was incredibly taxing on the Ottoman Empire, both from a um, point of view of defending the uh, viability of the Ottoman Empire, but also from the perspective of having foreign leaders being able to direct Ottoman finances. That said, 
the Germans were able to inculcate a level of trust and um, an alliance with uh, the Ottomans that the Ottomans were willing to allow them to administer the uh, administer the public administration group. The next thing is the Germans sent military advisors um, to the Ottoman Empire. Probably the most famous of these was Major Baron Kolmann von der Goltz. Um, uh, von der Goltz um, spent over 20 years in the Ottoman Empire and was responsible for training uh, Ottoman troops in more modern and advanced techniques than they had had in 1878, as well as introducing new weaponry. Over the course of the period from 1880 until 1914, over 4,000 different uh, German um, advisors were sent to the Ottoman Empire in order to reform and promote their military. Von der Goltz was also very much a monarchist and a traditionalist and supported Abdul Hamid against many of the struggles that we're going to see in this later period, um, giving much of his adult life to defending the Ottoman Empire from its modernizers. In particular, you can see him here uh, at a rail station in Bitola. Bitola is, of course, in the Balkans region, and much of uh, Van der Goltz's time was spent teaching the Ottoman Third Army and Ottoman Second Army how to defend the Balkans uh, from the increasing uh, Bulgarian, Greek, and Serbian incursions. We're going to discuss a lot of that next week. Now, we also see German education being developed uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Now, this is the Deutsche Schule Istanbul on the lower left-hand side. Now, the Deutsche Schule Istanbul actually precedes the reign of uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid II. That said, many new German schools were opened during this period, and at first they only admitted foreign Germans who happened to be living in Constantinople, but after a while they became open to Turkish uh, citizens as well, and these Turkish citizens would uh, learn German and facilitate that relationship with Germany. Germany also wanted a way to attack India, if possible, through the Ottoman Empire and facilitated the construction of the Baghdad Berlin Railway. That means uh, that railway went all the way to the European part of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire and continued east um, all the way to its terminus at Baghdad, which was completed in 1905. The Germans invested heavily in building this Ottoman infrastructure, and this would lead to numerous rail lines across the Ottoman Empire, including the more famous Hejaz Railway. The Germans also constructed telegraph facilities all throughout the Ottoman Empire, modernizing communication and developments within that country. And this, these were housed by several major German firms, as opposed to the German government working directly. But the German assistants also requested some help from the Ottomans as well. And while a lot of that will come manifest in World War I, some of it occurred even earlier. In particular, um, there was a group called the Kansu or Gansu Braves. These were Chinese fighters who fought in the Boxer Rebellion, but were Muslim by origin, sorry, but were Muslim by heritage. They are, in Chinese nomenclature, they're called Hui, uh, Chinese Muslims. And as the Sultan was the Caliph of all Sunni Muslims, he had the ability to issue fatwas that would be binding on Muslims in other countries. And so the Germans requested that Sultan Abdul Hamid issue a fatwa ordering the Kansu Braves to stand down uh, during the Boxer Rebellion because the Kansu Braves were actually quite effective um, in defeating German positions that they were holding during that rebellion. And the Sultan did issue a fatwa um, uh, in this regard, uh, but by the time that they delivered it to China, it took about a year, the conflict was already over and the Kansu Braves were already defeated. But that said, um, it shows that the Germans not only understood the strategic value of the location of the Ottoman Empire, which was something that the British had previously understood, but they also understood the spiritual significance of the Ottoman Sultan being the Caliph of the entire Muslim world. Within Syria, uh, as part of that Damascus Hama Railroad, right? We talked about how the Berlin-Baghdad uh, Railroad opened up the way for many more railroads to be formed. Another one, as I said, was the Hejaz Railway, but the Hejaz Railway really starts at Damascus and moves further south. One of the things that connected Aleppo in the north of Syria and was along the Baghdad-Berlin Railway uh, with the Hejaz Railway was the damascus Hama Railway. And so you can see the construction there in 1895. But during the period of 1889 to 1890, while this railroad was in its early days of construction, there was 
a lot of uh, a lot of uh, issues, agricultural issues, in what is called the Hauran. And the Hauran is this area you can see on the map in the dotted lines. It is uh, between what is today the Israeli uh, Golan Heights border um, on the western side, um, some parts of northern Jordan, but mostly it's within Syria. Within Syria, and it's an area where um, the majority of the local population were um, were peasants and were living on very little uh, amounts of land. Um, and they were troubled by both Syrian Bedouins and the Druze landlords. They demanded that the landlords be forced to only have one eighth of an allotment of the total territory. Um, and even some Druze were willing to uh, lead the rebellion. That, this is Sultan al-Atrash. Now, while he was too young for the, uh, to be a leader of this rebellion, his family, the Alatrash family, was the Druze family that led the mostly non-Druze peasants, mostly Sunni and Shiite Muslims, as well as Maronite Christians, um, in, uh, in a war against uh, the Ottoman Empire and the Syrian Bedouins uh, who were restricting their access to land. The Ottoman government was willing to pacify the, the rebellion by granting its wish of limiting the land and restructuring uh, the Ottoman concessions. The reason this is important is that this creates a landed peasantry within Syria that is unlike anything else that had previously existed in the Arab world. Historically, um, the Bedouins were able to keep most of the farmland for their pastoral herds. Um, and they were able to do this through the threat of violence. The fact that the Ottoman state was now able to uh, bring enough firepower to push the Bedouin out of the farmable land um, and needed to do so in order to complete the building of the railway would fundamentally shift the power from the Bedouins who had, dominant, who had a dominant uh, ability in lowland regions that they could easily move into uh, to the uh, local peasant population. And that will have incredible effects in terms of developing what would be the Arab resistance movements in the 20th century. Now, in 1896, we also have a movement from uh, the Jewish community. Now, we're going to talk about Zionism as a whole in uh, piece in another uh, presentation, probably sometime in August or September. But I wanted to sort of discuss on how it impacts Abdul Hamid. So, Theodor Herzl, who was the founder of the modern Zionist movement, the movement to bring Jews uh, from the various countries in which they had been inhabiting uh, to a singular Jewish country uh, that, that Jews would govern as an, uh, as an ethnic state in the same way that other ethnicities had ethnic states uh, throughout Europe. Um, he's consolidating this and trying to figure out a way to create this Jewish state. And of course, uh, Jewish hopes had generally pinned on having the land in the Southwest Levant uh, that they call the land of Israel. Um, that was called in those days, it was divided between the, uh, uh, the province of Damascus and the province of Jerusalem um, and certain parts of the province of Beirut. Um, so the Ottoman Empire basically um, had this territory within its control. Theodor Herzl's primary goal was to acquire that land. And so he got together um, a number of different bankers, some were Jews, some were non-Jews, who believed in the Zionist movement. In fact, there were a number of Protestants in the United Kingdom that were very much in favor of the Zionist movement for a variety of reasons. Um, and in 1896, he was able to bring forth a 20 million pound uh, proposal of money. Now, the Ottoman Empire's debt, we talked about the public debt administration, uh, the total debt of the Ottoman Empire was around 105 million pounds. So this 20 million pounds would be effectively one fifth of the Ottoman debt. Uh, so it's not an insignificant sum. And in 1896, um, Theodor Herzl offers to buy the territory of the land of Israel from Abdul Hamid. Abdul Hamid's response is very famous and has become one of the rallying cries um, in an irredentist um, in an irredentist Turkish world. Abdul Hamid II um, famously said, advise Mr. Herzl not to take another step in this matter. I cannot sell even a foot of land for it does not belong to me, but to the Ummah or Muslim nation. The Ummah have won this empire by fighting for it with their blood and have fertilized it with their blood. 
we will again cover it with our blood before we allow it to be wrested away from us, end quote. So we can see that this is a firm denial of Herzl's attempt to acquire, uh, acquire the territory. Um, and this really begins the development of modern Turkish anti-Semitism. That's not to say that there was no anti-Semitism before this point, but we really don't see um, a coherent set of Zionist or Jewish conspiracies in the Ottoman Empire prior to this moment. Afterwards, we see a number of them, and they usually rely on, on, on certain tropes. For example, one of them is that the Jews are trying to undermine the Ottoman government through collaboration with the West. Um, a perfect example of this uh, is the manifest um, conspiracy theory that Ataturk, uh, the founder of the modern Republic of Turkey, was actually a Dunma or a crypto Jew. And you can see uh, this article on the right hand side, which was um, a discussion of that uh, conspiracy. To add insult to injury, um, Theodor Herzl, uh, in particular, stressed um, his fellow Jews' ability to uh, change European perceptions of the Ottoman Empire um, as an attempt to improve his likelihood of being able to get a state for the Jewish people. And for example, we're going to talk about the Hamidian massacres in, in a minute. Um, when those were going on, Herzl proposed to Abdul Hamid that he would get uh, Jews to promote the Ottoman Empire and discredit the Armenian narrative um, in the West uh, in exchange for land or the right to build uh, within, within the land of Israel, something that other Zionists, especially those led by Max Nordau, um, vehemently disagreed with, um, holding that the Armenian uh, situation should not be something that the Jews should uh, be able to play with or negotiate with um, because that is a separate crisis of their own. Understandably, this and views like this have had repercussions in the Armenian community, uh, where they see Israel's alliances today um, as being somewhat uh, inconsiderate of Ar Armenia's political and social situation. Getting to the Mileti Sadaka, uh, or the righteous, uh, or the loyal, yeah, the loyal millet. Um, which is what the Armenians were called, because prior to the 1870s, we really don't have any large-scale Armenian revolts. And we have Armenians concentrated in the eastern regions of the empire, but in no place except for maybe a few regions around Lake Vaughan, um, and no place are they really the majority. They're significant minorities throughout the Ottoman Empire. And as a population, we're probably talking about something within the realm of 1.5 to 2 million. But they don't make up a majority in any specific location, which is different than the Balkans. The Armenians during this period are plagued with a number of issues. The first primary issue that they're suffering is legal inequality. While in while on paper their testimony is worth equal to that of a Muslim, in a lot of the courts, especially in the eastern parts of Anatolia, where the control of Constantinople is much weaker, they don't have the equal rights of testimony. And they don't have the right to refute any of the testimony that they don't like if it comes from a Muslim. We also have a distinction uh, beginning to develop between the Amira class, which are the Armenians in Istanbul, who are incredibly intellectual and connected with the goings on in the Sultanate, with the majority of the Armenian population, which is relatively poor or middle class in the eastern part of the empire. And so the situations faced by both of these groups are starkly different. Accordingly, the Armenian millet leaders, the millet basha, that are based in Istanbul, really have the concerns of the Amira class in mind, not the concerns of the larger Armenian population. And this creates a lot of friction because the Armenians feel that the Ottoman systems designed to promote them are the very systems that are leading to them being silenced, because the Ottomans would argue the Armenians already have a representative. Um, and they don't think it's an issue, as opposed to, oh, you're bringing up an issue and you've never been heard from before. And the issue of the Armenians and of that part of the Ottoman Empire in general was called the Eastern question. And so you had leaders like Gladstone, that prime minister of the United Kingdom saying, 
to serve Armenia is to serve civilization. And um, they were working um, to at least nominally protect Armenians uh, who are living in the East. Now we talked about that during the war of 1878 that there were Kurdish and Circassian raiders. Remember the Circassians having been deported from the Russian empire were now incredibly loyal to the Ottoman state. And so they saw no issue with fighting anybody that they perceived to be an enemy of the Ottoman state. And so this would mean attacks on Armenians. Uh, it was well known by the time the Treaty of Berlin was being negotiated in 1878 that these attacks were common. And there were provisions in the Treaty of Berlin, like Article 61, that were designed to address this issue, uh, requiring the Ottoman state to protect the Armenian populations. Um, there's a question of who are others. Um, the others here refer to on the map, because you see Armenians, Kurds, and Turks. The others here refer to Circassians, Laws, Greeks. Um, there are a number of Christian and Muslim populations that are encapsulated by that others. There's also some Jews in this region, but they're not very plentiful. Um, in Halep, uh, the reason others is so big is because that includes the Arabs. Um, so the Armenians are subject to these policies. And as I pointed out, with the exception of Vaughan, where it's a very meager majority, um, most of these regions do not have Armenian majorities, even if they have Armenian pluralities. There's a question, were there more Armenians in the Russian empire or the Ottoman empire? At this point in time, there were probably more Armenians in the Ottoman empire. Um, although the numbers were shifting uh, for reasons that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Now, it's worth talking at this moment that the Kurds were divided into a number of different tribes. And some of these tribes were directly antagonistic towards the Armenians. For example, in 1879, there was a large scale famine in the East. And so Kurds, many Kurds turned on their Armenian neighbors and stole from them. And of course, one of the longstanding grievances of the Armenians is that the Ottoman Empire would never pursue action against these Kurdish tribes. But at the same time, there were Kurdish tribes who reached out to both the Armenian and Assyrian communities that were in the region, like Sheikh Ubaidullah Meh. Sheikh Ubaidullah had, uh, had a revolt in 1880, um, and he was consolidating the Kurds in their various tribal units. Now, if we remember from last time, we discussed that the Kurds had a number of different statelets prior to about 1840. But after, but in the 1840s and 1850s, most of these statelets were destroyed by the Ottoman Empire during the Ottoman Empire's attempt to nationalize and unify uh, the Eastern regions and turn them into provinces. So these Kurds were devolved back into tribes. Sheikh Abedullah was the first person to put forth a coherent idea of Kurdish nationalism, that all Kurds should be part of one nation, and that that Kurdish nation was separate and distinct from the other, uh, from the other peoples of the region, the Turks, the Persians, and the Arabs. He, as I said, he reached out to the Armenians and the Assyrians. His probably strongest allies from among the non-Kurds were the Tiari tribe of the Assyrians. And in fact, he wrote uh, numerous times to the Sultan that the Tiari were his staunchest allies and supporters, despite being Nestorian Christians. Um, and there's a funny story that a Protestant missionary from the region retells where Sheikh Obedullah had sent a letter describing this exactly to the Sultan, the Sultan sent it back and it went back and forward three times um, with the Sultan keep saying that this is not accurate. And Sheikh Abedullah says, I don't know anything about politics but I do know something about truth telling. And um, this is the truth. So you, have, so you have these wildly different positions from different Kurdish leaders. Um, you have those that are like Sheikh Abedullah who was uh, removed from power in 1880, uh, later in the year, uh, after he, sorry, in 1881, after he was defeated by the Persian Qajars and sent into exile um, in, uh, in what's today Saudi Arabia, uh, where he died in 1883. But Sheikh Abedullah had positive relations with the Christian population. You have other Kurdish tribes that survived from pillaging them. And the Circassians were almost overwhelmingly uh, strongly nationalistic. And so you have the Armenians trying to find a way to push back in order to try and defend themselves from these Kurdish raids and attacks. 
They tried to promote the implementation of Article 61 under the Treaty of Berlin that would require the Ottoman Empire to do something about their situation. In fact, they'd even sent um, Makarchi, uh, the Catholicos, um, Makarchi Chrimian, in 1878 to the Congress of Berlin in order to speak on the Armenian case. But since the Armenians did not have a country, legally speaking, they were not allowed to represent their own interests at the meeting, which many Armenians were thoroughly incensed by. So you have Makertic uh, Portukalian, and Portukalian, you can see him in the center there. He develops along with a number of other Armenian intellectuals, the first Armenian political party called the Armenikon party. And the goal of the Armenikon party was to create a more effective means of Armenian rights. And that could be manifested in several forms. Uh, in, some, uh, in the most extreme cases, it would require independence, but that was a very minority position within the Armenikon group. Most of them believed in devolution, that there should be an Armenian province created within the Ottoman Empire where the Armenians would be able to self-govern. The belief that it may have been more than that was quote, confirmed, end quote, by the Bashkala incident, which occurred in 1889. This occurred outside of the village of Bashkala, which had an Armenian population alongside a larger Turkish population in, in, West, in Eastern Anatolia. And outside of Bashkale, um, Ottoman soldiers stopped uh, three Armenians who were members of the Armenikon party. Uh, two of them were killed, one of them managed to escape, but in the, uh, the possession of uh, those Armenians were documents discussing a separatist movement uh, in Armenia to try and break the Armenian majority regions away from the Ottoman Empire's control. As I said, it was not the majority position of the Armenikon party for this, but this seeded a conspiracy theory um, within the Ottoman Empire that had already been building, that the Armenians were somehow going to be disloyal to the Ottoman Empire and that they would not respect the norms of the Ottoman Empire in terms of negotiating and dealing with the issues internally. So Abdul Hamid II decides that he is going to intimidate the Armenian population in order to compel them to abandon this uh, desire for self-government. And he creates what are called the Hamidia al Lara, or the Hamidia Irregulars. And these are Kurdish and Circassian uh, troops that have some military training, but are not formalized into normal units. And these, uh, Hamidia are allowed to operate without imp uh, with impunity throughout the Eastern Anatolia region, enforcing the will of Abdul Hamid against uh, any of the Armenians that could be suspected to be separatists. Because these Hamidia al had carte blanche to attack the Armenian positions, what ended up happening is that the Armenians felt that they needed to acquire their own defensive strategy to deal with them. The legal apparatus was explicitly forbidden from going after the Hamidia al -Lara. So that apparatus becomes centralized in Russia um, and exported to Armenia. And it comes in the wave of several different parties. The first group uh, and of these parties, all of them except one federate into one group called the Dashnat Sutyun. Uh, which I'm going to say is Dashnak, which is usually how it's referred to. Um, and Dashnak Tsutyun um, stands for the larger phrase, which translates into English as the Armenian Revolutionary Front. And there was a different group, the Hunchakian Party, um, uh, which decided not to join the Dashnaks. Um, and so we're going to follow the Dashnaks and the Hunchaks um, throughout this period. Now, both were based in what is today Armenia in, on the Russian side of the border. And their ideology began to spread over to the Turkish uh, uh, um, Ottoman side of the border. The, uh, the Dashnaks and the Hunjaks both argued that the Armenians needed to create an independent nation state. They could no longer survive under the Ottomans in any meaningful capacity, but that they would modify their stance in accordance with the needs of the situation and would be willing to negotiate with Ottoman authorities for autonomy or for protections rather than independence if such a thing could be shown to work. And so you can see on the top, those are Zorian, Mikaelian, and Zavarian. These are the three major founders of the Dashnaks. Um, 
And the reason actually the Dashnaks and Hunchaks couldn't unite um, as the Dashnaks had united all the other uh, Armenian groups was that the, uh, the Hunchaks felt that the Dashnaks were not sufficiently socialist enough. Now, the Dashnaks felt that, uh, felt that the uh, Armenian patriarch in Constantinople in the Kumkape district, because the Kumkape district was the district of Istanbul where the Armenians lived, the Armenian patriarch in Kumkape was not uh, actively fighting on behalf of the Armenian people, uh, not rallying to their ideological or social defense, especially as these Hamidia irregulars started moving across the countryside. And so uh, they marched into the church and forced uh, the patriarch uh, to address the situation um, in what's called the Kumkape demonstration. The members of the Dashnaks who took control of the church then issued their own proclamation that they were fighting on behalf of the Armenian population in order to uh, protect them from the increasing dangers within the Ottoman Empire. We also have the Hunchakians uh, develop the Fidei, which were um, uh, militant bands that would move about Eastern Anatolia in order to match uh, firepower for firepower, um, the Hamidia irregulars. Now, there were far fewer Hunchaks in number than the Hamidia irregulars, but um, the Armenians trained very diligently and were able in many cases um, to match uh, the Hamidia that were assembled before, uh, against them, as long as those Hamidia were not organized into a coherent military battalion. Remember that they're irregulars and so they don't have proper training. The first real clash between the Dashnaks and um, no, sorry, the first real uh, clash between the Hunchaks and the um, Hamidia in a serious uh, military development was in 1894 in the region of Sassoon, which is in Eastern Turkey. For those of you who know me, this is not at all related to my name. My name is not, has no origin connected with this. So um, in Sassoon, um, you had a number of Armenians from the Hunchaks training the local population in order to defend themselves against the Hamidia, and so they revolted in order to take direct power for themselves. Uh, you can see Medz Murad, um, or Great Murad. Uh, he was, that's his code name. Um, he was the Armenian leader of the resistance. The Sassoon resistance was crushed uh, by Kurdish forces. Um, and this inaugurated um, what has come to be known as the Hamidian massacres. Now, the Hamidian massacres occurred between 1894 and 1896 and would kill between 150,000 and 200,000 Armenians and probably about 20,000 to 25,000 Assyrians. So this is, not, uh, this is not the same scale as the genocide. The genocide is about one, uh, uh, one level higher in terms of casualties, uh, one order of magnitude higher, but this is certainly um, an intentional uh, at, uh, attack against the Armenian population. Following the Sassoon revolt, Abdul Hamid II ordered uh, the Hamidia to move in a unified fashion against the Armenian and Assyrian communities throughout the Ottoman Empire. We also have a number of Ottoman um, Turkish mullahs um, who inspired their, uh, uh, their uh, communities to rise up against the Assyrians and the Armenians in their midst. And so, for example, you can see the massacres of Armenians and Assyrians at Diyarbakir, significant portions of the city of Diyarbakir, which the um, Armenians know as uh, Amida, um, were attacked and destroyed, many people dying through bayoneting or being cut up with swords and scimitars, uh, in addition to being uh, fired upon or, um, or burnt out. In, in particular, when it comes to burning out, we have a horrible incident in uh, the city of Urfa, um, where the church there, um, many Armenians had hidden the church, and then the Turks um, and uh, Kurds in the Hamidia irregulars um, barricaded the church to prevent um, the Christians who had gone inside from leaving, the Armenians from leaving, and burnt the church with them alive in it. Um, it's estimated that 3,000 died in that cathedral burning. You also have large scale corpses um, in numerous areas. This is outside of Erzurum um, and a significant percentage of Armenians in that area um, were killed and laid in these large scale burials or lack of burials is better term. 
In addition, we see something that we're going to see in far greater quantities, but still present. Um, during the uh, uh, during the Armenian genocide, uh, and these are forced conversions. Many uh, Armenian women are forcibly converted to Islam and are enslaved um, by um, Turkish or Kurdish men, um, and they are uh, raped, and then they are made to be effectively the wife slash slave of the family. In many cases, these women receive a specific tattoo um, over their bottom lip or their upper lip in order to designate them as these kinds of convert slaves. Um, so that way, if they ran away, they could be properly identified. It is um, from the perspective of modern uh, genocide scholarship, the Hamidia massacres certainly bear many of the marks of genocide in the sense that there is an intentional uh, attack on a specific population with, uh, with the goal of eradicating them or substantially minimizing their population. And that's exactly what happened here. That's not to say that the Armenians didn't fight back. There are a few cases of Armenian uh, perseverance in the face of violence during the Hamidian massacres. One, uh, one uh, place in particular was Zeytun. This is actually a picture of Zeytun from 1914. Uh, the city today is known as Suleymanla because the Turkish have renamed it. Um, but Zeytun was a city with an almost exclusively Armenian population and had for centuries been ruled by Armenians um, as Multazims. We talked about, for example, how Bashir Shahab II was a Multazim who ruled um, as a Christian in Mount Lebanon. There were Christian Multazims who ruled here in Zeytun. Now, during the Hamidian revolt, uh, sorry, the Hamidian massacres, there were attempts to um, take Zeytun from the Armenians, but the Armenians were able to hold those positions. And the people who had ruled our, uh, that region before, the Ishkhan, uh, or Armenian princes, were able to retain their positions because of how effectively they had trained and how effectively they were able to fight off the Turkish incursions in 1895. In the city of Vaughan in the east, um, there was a defense. Now, the term defense of Vaughan can refer to either the battle in 1914 or the battle in 1896. I'm referring here to the battle in 1896. The defense of Vaughan did not go well. Um, and the Turks and Kurds were able to overcome the Armenian defenses of the city and massacred a significant portion of the Armenian population in the city. It's particularly troubling that one of these massacres was after the Armenians had surrendered and they were being marched out of the city, another group of Kurds attacked them and killed them. Approximately 3,000 were killed in that massacre after the Armenians had already surrendered to the Hamidia forces directed by Abdul Hamid II. As reprisal uh, for this violence meted out on Armenians who had already surrendered, there, uh, the Dashnaks put together the Khanasur expedition. And you can see the men uh, who are preparing for the Khanasur expedition uh, in this photograph. And the Khanasur expedition went after those particular Hamidia units that had attacked in Vaughan in 1897 and killed a number of Kurds in this reprisal action. Outside of Turkey, uh, especially in the West, um, Abdul Hamid's reputation was thoroughly sullied. Um, by this massacre of the Armenians. And he came to be known as the Red Sultan. Um, as you can see there uh, on the left-hand side uh, from the French magazine, L'Assiette au Bar, um, he's cleaning his sword on the garment of the constitution, right? He's ignoring the constitution of the Armenian people, uh, sorry, the constitution of the Ottoman Empire, which would protect the Armenian people. And he's instead butchering them. We also see during this period that Abdul Hamid is overtly sexualized. It's actually one of the interesting things that the Ottoman Empire, in order to show how old fashioned and how um, disrespectful it was of women in, in sort of a larger perspective, uh, they sexualized the Sultan of having these harems. Um, and you can see in this picture, he's trying to woo the women while they themselves are trying to woo the young Turks, right? The modernizers of the empire, um, but are locked and chained effectively within the walls of the harem um, by Abdul Hamid. 
We also have books like Abdul Hamid Intim, um, which was a pseudobiography written by um, a man who uh, used a pseudonym here of G. Doris. And while it pretended to be a biography, it painted Abdul Hamid as just um, as a total monster, as opposed to the nuanced political figure that he was. We even have stories uh, that were written by Turks who were living in Paris, right? Remember that many, uh, in many cases, intellectuals had been forced out of the empire into Geneva or Paris. And so we have Jalal Nouri Bey, uh, who wrote in, uh, in French and in uh, this novel, which is, this is the English version of it, called The Sultan. And it's a, and it's a fictional account of a Circassian female slave named Murghe Irem. And Murghe um, tells the story from her point of view um, of how she's forced and repeatedly raped, of course, because she doesn't really give consent uh, um, by Abdul Hamid. And he's just the most horrible person. Every time that they interact, she has only the worst adjectives to describe him. Um, and books like this, novelizations like this, and, ca and cartoons of this, of this type really painted an image of irredeemability uh, to uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid uh, II, um, which may well have been deserved, um, but, but this uh, was gained through uh, propaganda as opposed to an accurate assessment of the man's uh, failures. Now, this sort of responds to the earlier question of were there more Armenians in the Russian occupied zones or in the Ottoman Empire occupied zones? In 1828, when uh, the Treaty of Turkmenchai gave Erivan Khanet to the Russian Empire, the Russians realized the territory was 80% Muslim and they wanted to increase the Christian population in order uh, to allow that area to be a bastion um, of Russian power on the far side of the Caucasus. And so you can see different waves of immigration um, coming from the Ottoman Empire and from Persia um, into the Erevan, Khan, uh, Erevan government, such that by the census of 1897, Armenians composed 55% of the government's population, um, going from about 100,000 to about 300,000. Um, the, uh, the Turkish population in this, uh, in this time did not decrease, it actually increased. Uh, but it increased at a much slower population, uh, Muslim population increased much more slowly, which is why the Armenians became such a dominant percentage of the population. Now, um, for the most part, the Russians were supportive of these Armenians, naturally, because they were both Christians, but you had a consistent attempt to, ortho, uh, to orthodoxize the Armenian church, because if we remember, the Armenian church is what's called Oriental Orthodox. They don't accept um, the fourth ecumenical council, the Council of Chalcedon. The Russian Orthodox Church is Eastern Orthodox, which means that they do accept that council. And so these churches are not in communion. The Russian Orthodox, therefore, believed it was their duty to orthodoxize uh, the Armenians. And to the extent that this became manifest, especially in 1903, um, it led to organizations like the Dashnaks, which had previously relied on Russian support to distance themselves from Russia, because the effort to orthodoxize the Armenian church was seen in many ways as trying to destroy Armenian cultural heritage. That was led on the Russian side by Grigory Sergeyevich uh, Golitsyn. Now, as far as we can tell, Golitsyn was an Armenophobe, um, deeply distrustful and hating uh, of Armenians. In fact, he, uh, he appointed Velichka um, to do a demographic survey of the Caucasus, who had, uh, who is also known for being an Armenophobe, and many of his writings are often cited by modern Armenophobes to argue that the Armenians are lazy or worthless people. In 1903, he approved the Expropriation Act, which would require every Armenian church to become the property of the Russian state and to be lost to the Armenian people. This affected every church, Armenian church within the Russian Empire, but it was especially troublesome uh, because of Echmiaz Din. Uh, Echmiaz Din um, is the Vatican of the Armenian church, uh, and it's located in Bagar Shapat in the modern day country of Armenia. And this was expropriated too in 1903, resulting in wide scale uproar from the Armenian population within, within the Russian territory. Now, in 1904, 
uh, Golitsyn was uh, removed from his position and more conciliatory pro-Armenian Russians were put in his place. But the Dashnaks and the Hunchaks knew that they could not rely entirely on Russia uh, to support them and became in many cases self-funded um, through petitioning Armenians in the Amir class who'd be willing to donate um, to donate to them and to get a groundswell of support from local Armenians as well. But to, and to answer the question of where were more Armenians, even in um, 1897, there were fewer than 1 million Armenians within the Russian empire and there were over 1.5 million in the Ottoman empire. So the population was still significantly larger in the Ottoman Empire than it was in Russia, although the numbers were changing. The Armenians, because of the Hamidian massacres, which resulted in Abdul Hamid II claiming the Armenian question to have been resolved, um, the Armenians were trying to take desperate actions in order to um, remove Sultan Abdul Hamid from power and anything um, would be acceptable in their view. So Sultan Abdul Hamid II was known for going to the Yildiz Hamidia Mosque um, in order to do prayers. And so Christopher Mikaelian, before he was one of the three Dashnak leaders, um, Mikaelian um, timed everything to create a bomb that would explode in front of the mosque and kill the Sultan. In fact, uh, Mikaelian himself died while testing uh, prototype bombs in Bulgaria. Um, his successors actually uh, did launch the bomb, but on that day, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid was talking to the Sheikh Ul Islam, the leading Muslim leader in the empire, and his conversation went a little bit over long. So, even, so the bomb that was timed went off before the Sultan was directly in range. That said, the bomb did still kill over 20 people and maim over 50. But uh, the Sultan himself was unscathed by the assassination attempt. Of course, this resulted in uh, retribution against the Armenian community afterwards. So, but it's not only the Armenians that didn't like Abdul Hamid and his style of repressive governance. In Thessaloniki and Greece, a number of different uh, parties that would consolidatedly be called the Young Turks came together in order to discuss the future of the empire. And the Young Turks basically broke down into two major groups. There were minor groups as well, but two major groups. Um, you had the liberals led by Prince of Ahaddin. And when I say prince, I literally mean it. He was a prince of the Ottoman Empire, but he was in exile because of his European leaning views. And when we say the liberal party, we mean it in sort of a British sense of the word liberal. Um, they believed in laissez-faire economics, alliances with the West, increasing um, uh, personal rights and similar things like that. And then you have uh, the Committee of Union and Progress. You can see Ahmed Reza, who was one of the leading members of the Committee of Union and Progress. Um, and, the, and this committee or the CUP was more interested in an organized militaristic form of government that would lead um, based on a union, union style of government, meaning that the Ottoman Empire would be united uh, under one uh, autocratic leadership, just one that they would be in charge of. So, but these two groups came together with a third group, which is the Ottoman Third Army. In the Balkans, and we're gonna talk about this next week, there were a lot of wars going on between the various Christian states, the Greeks, the Bulgarians, the Serbians, and the Montenegrins. Um, and the Ottoman Empire was effectively incapable of dealing with all of these fights, many of which occurred on sovereign Ottoman territory. And the Ottoman Third Army believed that some solution had to come from Constantinople to actually solidify the borders of the Ottoman Empire and return the empire back to its original strength. And so Abdul Hamid had to go, not because of his inability to rule domestically, but his inability to enforce Ottoman policy and borders. Even the Dashnaks were willing to join in with this Turkish descent. Um, all of the meeting in Thessaloniki and what's modern day Greece was then part of the Ottoman Empire um, to discuss the overthrow of the Sultan. But when the Ottoman Third Army joined with the CUP and the liberals, it finally meant that they might have the ability to overthrow the government. 
but they were waiting for the right moment to strike. And the right moment was this. We had talked about three episodes ago, how the great game between Britain and Russia um, had threatened to divide uh, the Middle East. But by 1907, the British and the French came to a convention where the British would maintain a sphere of influence in the southeastern part of Iran, the Russians would maintain a sphere of influence in the northern part of Iran, and therefore they would avoid conflict. Afghanistan would remain in the British sphere, and Russians would not attempt an invasion of either Afghanistan or of China. Accordingly, the British and the French, sorry, the British and the Russians moving closer and closer together, such as the meeting of King Edward VIII and Nicholas II in Tallinn, um, meant that the historic ally of the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, was going to actually be an ally of the historic enemy of the Ottoman Empire, of Russia. And the Ottomans couldn't allow the, uh, the Ottoman Empire in that kind of foreign policy situation to continue uh, under the leadership of Abdul Hamid, who was clearly incompetent in terms of managing the defense. So the CUP and the Ottoman Third Army uh, acted together. They threatened the leader of the Ottoman First Army, Haider Pasha. They assassinated the leader of the Second Army, that's Shemsi Pasha, you can see there. Um, and then compelled Abdul Hamid II to accept uh, the reinstatement of the constitution, a new creation of the parliament and the compromise um, leading to uh, equality for all Ottoman citizens. You can see in the lower right, the young Turks um, in, 18, in 1908 declaring their revolution had to have occurred. The young Turks, including the CUP and the liberals, um, all of whom are part of this new Turkish uh, run state. And the leaders um, who instigate this revolt are um, in Constantinople are Major Ahmed Niyazi Bey and Enver Ismail Bey. Uh, in fact, this is the first time that we're seeing Enver Ismail. We will see him many, many times um, over the course of the next few sessions. So in 1908, there was an election and it's very interesting. Um, the liberals don't do that well in the election. And the Committee for Union and Progress does okay. They get about 20 to 25% of the seats. The majority of the seats are taken up by independents from various different parties. And in the election, the seats are allocated pretty well if you uh, consider the ethnicities of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Turks only get 147 seats. They only get about half of the seats because they're about half the population of the empire. The Arabs get 60 seats. Um, there are even Jewish seats and Slavic seats, um, which correspond to those populations within the empire. From the position of the CUP, um, this would not allow them to exercise their dictatorial fiat. Um, and so we would have to undergo a number of further processes. That said, in 1909, there was a counter-revolution. Um, and that counter-revolution was led by um, Dervish Vahdeti. You can see him in the lower right-hand side. Dervish Vahdeti was born in Cyprus. He was um, a uh, he was a very pious Muslim and probably one of the first Islamists. And, and an Islamist, we're going to probably have a session on this sometime in September or October, is somebody who believes that a modern state should be governed by Islamic theocratic principles. And so that differentiates him from a historical um, the, uh, Muslim theocrat, because that would be within the context of a medieval Muslim state. Now, Dervish Vahdeti um, published his own newspaper called Vulkan, which talked about how the granting of rights to Christians and Jews, the equality um, envisioned by the Ottoman constitution, were all flying in the face of Islam and were thoroughly disrespectful of the Muslims' rightful place as the sovereigns in their own land. Now, there was a newspaper uh, by the liberals uh, called Serbesti. Um, it had a number of authors, but in particular, um, one author, Hassan Fahmi Bey, was assassinated. And that became the linchpin for the counter-revolution in 1909. Now, the counter-revolution is often uh, called the March 31st revolution because by the Julian calendar, it occurred on March 31st. 
By the Gregorian calendar, it occurred about 14 days later on April 14th. So almost all of the action that we're discussing here takes place in the month of April, not in the month of March. And so for 10 days from April 14th to April 24th, um, the elected government, uh, primarily composed of young Turks, is forcibly expelled by Dervish Vahdeti and Abdul Hamid II, who was very happy um, to have been granted significantly more power by Dervish. While uh, Abdul Hamid II uh, took power, there was a division among the young Turks, both from the liberal camp and from the CUP. And the division was over whether or not they would try to keep this new government from going too reactionary, right? They would stay in Constantinople and try and negotiate with these, uh, with these conservative elements led by Vehdeti, or whether they would um, flee to another part of the empire and then try to take power back. In the former camp was Ismail Kemali, who was an Albanian a member of the Liberal Party, and he negotiated with Abdul Hamid and Dervish Vahdeti uh, in order to, um, in order to uh, set up the government. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that Vahdeti was able to expel the majority of uh, the, uh, the liberals in the CUP from the government um, because of his riot uh, with a number of soldiers coming from the Tashkeshla barracks in Istanbul um, and those soldiers were able to um, launch the coup against uh, the parliamentarians. Uh, Ismail Kamali tried to maintain their relations with Abdul Hamid. The majority of the CUP and liberals, as I said, fled to Salonika uh, or Thessaloniki in Greece. And together with the third army and the second army, they put together what they called the Harakit Ordusu or the action army. And the action army um, turned right back around on Constantinople and after several battles, managed to take it back from Abdul Hamid. You can see in the upper left-hand side, the Harakat Ordusu, or the Action Army, invading Constantinople to overthrow um, Abdul Hamid II and to put in power his uh, cousin, uh, Mehmet V Rashad. Rashad was his birth name. Um, Mehmet the, uh, was the fifth was his regnal name. And you can see this picture in the left-hand side of uh, the Young Turk coalition that came to remove um, Abdul Hamid II from power. Abdul Hamid being the second being the only Ottoman Sultan to have been removed by pow from power by a political party, as opposed to um, internal movements within uh, the Divan. And it's actually a very interesting mix of people, which shows how ecumenical the Young Turk movement was, even if the CUP itself was not as ecumenical. You have uh, Arif Hekmet Pasha, who was the rear admiral of the Navy. You have Emmanuel Carasso, who was from the Spanish Jewish community and lived in Istanbul. You have Esan Pasha Toptani, uh, who was from the Albanian Muslim community. You have Aram Efendi, who was from the Armenian uh, community. And Galit Bey, who was a colonel in the second army. All of them coming together um, to issue um, the statement that Abdul Hamid II should be removed from power. Now, of course, conservative elements in Turkey after this occurred uh, were very angry that both a Jew and an Armenian were responsible um, in part for the removal of an Ottoman Sultan. It doesn't matter that um, Esad Pasha Toptani, the Muslim Albanian, was the one who actually read the edict. The fact that non-Muslims were involved in the removal of a caliph was religiously uh, toxic for many of the more conservative Muslims within the empire. During those 10 days when Abdul Hamid II was in power, um, there was a fear among Muslims that the Armenians would try and create their own independent state in reaction to this counter-revolution. Of course, there was no actual evidence for this sentiment, but they believed that it was likely to happen. And so what ended up happening was that the Muslims alleged, and most uh, foreigners in the region uh, disagree with this, um, that uh, the Armenians were already starting to fight, and so the Muslims had to take vicious action against them. Of course, the vicious action against them was very well noted in the foreign journals. You can see uh, Le Petit Journal um, showing the massacres in Adana, 
um, and significant quarters of the uh, Armenian community in, Med in Adana, which was one of the wealthiest Armenian communities other than the Amir class, other than the Amir class in Istanbul. Um, and 20,000 Armenians were killed. Uh, it's believed another 5,000 Assyrians were also killed um, as these quarters were burned down. Um, in addition, there were over 500 orphans, uh, which led to the creation of three different orphanages. This is uh, the Darul Aleitem, um, which was uh, one of those three orphanages. Uh, the picture is from 1915, but um, it was constructed right after uh, this massacre in 1909. The massacre still continued even after the Harakat Ordusu had brought the CUP and the liberal parties back into power. Um, because the government in Istanbul did not send forces to quell it as quickly as they could have. Now, to show how disastrous the situation was, I wanted to compare uh, these images. You can see on the left-hand side, the, uh, the Armenian Christian quarter um, of Adana, and a few hundred meters or a few hundred yards away, um, you can see the Muslim uh, quarters in Adana completely unscathed, which shows the targetedness of these attacks. And similar to the Hamidian massacres, we had incidents of people being burned alive, people being shot, drowned, cut, all of the various forms of violence. One of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit was the war in Libya, the Italo-Turkish war. And sort of uh, to remind us that during the Ottoman Empire, Libya had a certain degree of autonomy given its physical separation from the rest of the Ottoman Empire. Remember in 1882, Egypt became part of the British state. And so there was no land connection between the Ottoman Empire, other provinces and, uh, and what's today Libya. And Libya was ruled uh, by a uh, extremist uh, Sufi group called the Senussids. Um, and this was no different in 1911 when Italy decided that it wanted to invade Libya and take it for its own. And there are a couple of reasons why Italy wanted to invade, but most of these revolve around prestige. During the conquest of Africa, Italy had been one of the later states to form in Europe. They only really unified in the 1860s, which meant that the majority of Africa had already been taken by then. And when Italy tried to conquer Ethiopia, they were decisively defeated in the Battle of Adawa, um, which was for, uh, in 1904 and 1905. And this was really saddening um, on the European stage because a group of Africans were able to defeat a European army. So in order to salvage its prestige, uh, the Italians budgeted an invasion of Libya that they would take and they would bring Libya under, its, under their control. The Senussids were led by um, the Senussi leader at that time and on the military battlefield, they were put, uh, their leader was Omar al-Muhtar, who was able to consolidate uh, Libyans from all over the, uh, the country, from different Arab tribes and different Amazigh tribes to work together to fight the Italians. Now, there's a few things that are really worth pointing out about the Italo-Turkish War. The first one is that it is really the precursor to World War I. We see a lot of things take place here that had never taken place in war before. For example, you can see Italian dirigibles bombing Turkish positions on Libyan territory. We had never had aerial bombardment before. That was a new development in this war. We also had trench style warfare um, being perfected and organized, uh, very similar to the trench style warfare of World War I. We also see that the war occurs on multiple fronts. We have Italian ships bombarding uh, Beirut and uh, the Dodecanese islands, like Rhodes. Um, which were part of the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, the Young Turks had neglected to create a navy uh, ever since coming to power in 1909, right? Because they overthrew the counter-revolution on April 24th, uh, 1909. So they were still in power, but they had neglected to form a navy, which meant that as Italy controlled the seas, it was nearly impossible for Turkey to send any military from Constantinople to, um, to Libya. And so they could only send military advisors. Mustafa Kemal, um, who had been part of the Harakat Ordusu, um, this action army, was sent as a lieutenant uh, to deal with Libya's muj uh, Mujahideen. And these Mujahideen were led by Omar al-Muhtar. But the problem is they couldn't even send a, uh, him 
properly there. He had to take a trip to Alexandria, posing as a field journalist, an archaeologist, uh, before he was able to sneak across the border into Libya, um, which meant that very few Turks were able to make it there. Another Turk who was able to make it there, of course, was uh, Enver Ismail. Um, and the Italians were actually not able to take a lot of territory on Libya during the war. And the only reason the war resolved in 1912 was because of the Balkan Wars and, uh, and the Ottoman Empire needing to focus on those, as well as the Italian ability to put a stranglehold on Turkish trade. And that surrender resulted in Italy not only losing, sorry, in, uh, the Ottoman Empire not only losing uh, Libya to the Italian Empire, but uh, the Dodecanese Islands as well. So you can see the Ottoman garrison at Rhodes surrendering in the lower right-hand side from an Italian newspaper. Now, the Italians were actually not able to consolidate their hold over Libya until well into the 1920s. Omar al-Muhtar uh, led a resistance movement uh, until he was captured in 1831 and hanged um, by the Italians. Now, during the period from 1909 to 1912, the CUP uh, decided to put a stranglehold on the other parts of the government and decided to uh, run elections that would be um, based on voter fraud and intimidation. Um, in fact, these uh, elections are called the Sopale uh, um, or the uh, election of clubs in Turkish because of how violent the CUP was to those who would vote for other parties in order to control the election. And of course, because of this, the CUP won a majority of seats. That said, the disastrous behavior of the CUP in the Italo-Turkish War led to a number of military officers uh, forming together what were called the Halaskar Zabiton, or the, or the savior officers. And their goal was to take back Constantinople as a coup against the CUP and put in power um, liberals um, in order to further that side of the revolution. And in fact, they were successful. The savior officers overthrew the CUP government and Mehmet Kamil Pasha um, was able to be, uh, Mehmet Kamil Pasha was able to become the prime minister and Ahmed Mutar Pasha, who was uh, a venerable general who had fought on the Caucasian side uh, in the Russo-Turkish War of 1878, became uh, one of the leading uh, diplomats of the empire as well. But unfortunately, just after that coup d'etat happened in the summer of 1912, uh, the first Balkan War broke out in October of 1912. And the Bulgarians were far more prepared than the Ottomans had even expected. Um, their offensive pushed back deep uh, into the Macedonian territory and they started making runs at Constantinople. You can see the delegates um, that were there at uh, Chitalja. Uh, and we'll talk more about the First Balkan War next week about what happened in that war. But what's important for what, happened, uh, uh, what happens internally in the Ottoman Empire is the following. At Chitalja, uh, you have um, Mehmet Ahmed Pasha. Uh, you can see him standing in the middle um, with uh, sort of his sword down um, and uh, a completely buttoned up coat. Um, he was negotiating with the Bulgarian representatives and was willing to make a number of concessions in exchange for a ceasefire, which is called the line of demarcation of the First Alliance. And you can see it gives almost all of Eastern Thrace and Western Thrace to the Bulgarians. It was deeply insulting uh, to most Ottomans and therefore in the eyes of many, um, the liberal coalition was not fit to rule. So in January of 1913, the CUP launched an insurrection against um, the liberal party and assassinated Nazim Pasha, the war minister of, uh, of the liberal led government and forced Mehmet Kamil Pasha uh, to resign his post. You can see Enver Ismail um, demand, uh, forcing uh, Mehmet Kamil to resign his commission and therefore the CUP took over the government. And in fact, the CUP uh, at this point was really led by three individuals and these three individuals would take many of the key ministries in 1913 um, 
from uh, the various parts of the parliamentary government. You have Mehmet Talat, uh, you have Enver Ismail and Ahmed Jamal. And these three individuals, we're going to see much more of them because the CUP triumvirate is the group that leads the Ottoman Empire through the First World War. Now, it's important to note just how dictatorial and how organized the CUP was in and of itself. Um, they had come to power through the Republican constitution, right? That, that constitution that would lead to a parliament and a democratic style of government with the monarch as a constitutional figurehead. But they were not interested in a lot of the norms and protections that that document provided. They were interested in their own rulership and a way that they could preserve the union of the Ottoman Empire. That was their foremost concern, that the Ottoman, union, that the Ottoman Empire would break up into multiple different states. And um, they proved their credentials to the Ottoman people um, in that first Balkan war, because they reversed a number of the land concessions that um, Mehmet at Kamil Pasha had made um, in uh, the Chatalja uh, armistice agreements and brought the city of Adrianople or Edirne back under Turkish control. Enver Ismail doing that secured the legitimacy of the CUP in the eyes of many Turks, regardless of the fact that they did not win uh, their power through the elections and they had repeatedly used the state mechanisms to subvert the will of the majority of the, of the Ottoman population. All right, questions, comments, concerns. Thanks, Aaron. Um, that's really nice to say that uh, that I did a great job. I, I it's a it's a very difficult topic, and uh, I wanted to try and present all the sides fairly, which is difficult in a situation like this. Um, there's a question of, can you talk about the Turkish refugees from the Balkans? Sure. Um, these refugees collectively are called muhajir um, or migrants. Um, these muhajir come from a variety of different ethnic groups, if we were to classify them. You have uh, Muslim Bulgarians, which are called Pomaks. You have Muslim Serbs, which are called Bosniaks today. Um, you have Muslim Macedonians, which are called Turbishi. You have Muslim Greeks, which are called Grecian Turks. You have um, a number of these different populations. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there's a Goranji as well, which are Muslim, uh, which are Muslim, another type of Muslim Serb, another type of Muslim Albanian. It's not entirely clear uh, where you would draw the line there. Um, you have Muslim Albanians as well, although Albania tends to be more religiously mixed. Um, and so a lot of these populations uh, fled uh, the increasing power of the Christian groups that were moving into the region. Uh, Serbians, Greeks, and Bulgarians were particularly intolerant of Muslims living within their territory. That's not to say that they expelled all of them. There were, uh, Bulgaria still has one seventh of its population being Muslim today. But um, in many respects, they could not expect fair treatment and they were subject to numerous massacres regardless. And so you had this population flooding into Anatolia, seeking safety and refuge in a way that you'd never seen before um, in the Ottoman Empire. And this would be heightened um, as the Balkan Wars uh, go on and numerous uh, Muslims in the region are displaced. In fact, today in Turkey, one in four people cl uh, claims to be a descendant of a muhajir uh, within the modern Turkish population. So it's uh, so it's an incredibly large uh, and disruptive aspect of migration within Turkey and further um, inflates the fears that many Turks had going into the First World War that they would be forcibly expelled if they lost any territory to non-Muslim uh, belligerents. Um, there's a question of what were the political ramifications within Turkey before World War I of these refugees? Um, just chronic instability. The, the, I mean, you have economic issues of people not being able to find jobs. You have settlement issues of uh, towns being overpopulated. You have um, electoral issues of you don't know how to register people. You have a lot of different uh, issues. And you also have um, language issues. A lot of them didn't speak Turkish. Um, they spoke 
a Slavic language or Greek or Albanian or uh, a local language from uh, the region, not from uh, not from Anatolia. Um, and there's a question, are any of those different ethnic refugee groups still in existence within modern Turkey? Absolutely. Um, they're not considered refugees, though. Um, in 1930, and this is something that we'll cover when we get to Ataturk, in 1930, um, the Kemalist uh, party uh, argued that the various ethnic groups that comp comprised the Muslim citizens of Turkey were themselves all misrepresentations of the true nature of these people, which is as a Turk. Um, and so the creation of Circassians, of Kurds, of laws, of, of the Muhajir, uh, these are all uh, developments of, uh, of division within the Muslim community. And so all citizens of Turkey, all Muslims of Turkey are Turks. Um, and this create, uh, while there were some ethnicities like the Laws, for example, who are ethnically Georgian Muslims, um, you have uh, the Circassians, um, you have Albanians. Many of these groups were not bothered by being both Albanian and a Turk or just being a Turk. Um, other groups like the Kurds really resented being mislabeled as Turks. Um, and so naturally that led to confrontations between Ataturk's Turkish government and the Kurds. But on the flip side, the Muhajir, many of whom were willing to embrace this nationality as sort of an anchor and a proof that they had a legitimate right to live uh, where they were, um, they sort of maintained that they were the descendants of Muhajir, but in truth, they were Turks. All right. so. Um, in terms of upcoming presentations, uh, Aaron and I are doing our fifth in the European Union series uh, this upcoming Sunday, and that will focus on European Union defense uh, in the early, uh, sorry, in the late 90s and early aughts. Um, and in a week, I believe we are doing the Ukraine presentation uh, where we will discuss the status of Ukraine. That's going to be in Sunday about nine days from today or 10 days from today. Um, in the upcoming week, we will do the Balkan revolutions, um, and uh, at that time, we will cover all of the various wars between the Christian parties um, in uh, the Balkans region, so we'll sort of see why this had such a cataclysmic effect on the politics within the Ottoman Empire that we saw today. We will also discuss in two weeks, I haven't put it up on Meetup yet, but I will soon, uh, we will discuss the Qajar uh, decline, sort of picking up where we left off in episode 36 um, to get the Ottoman, uh, to get the uh, Qajar empire exactly to where we are with the Ottoman empire on the brink of World War I. And then following that for two weeks, we will discuss World War I. Um, one day will be devoted to the battles uh, that the Ottoman empire faced, and the other will be devoted to the internal uh, situation within the Ottoman Empire during World War I, which will, of course, include the Armenian Genocide uh, and that discussion. So uh, unless anybody else has anything, I think um, we're going to call it a night.